Hello. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, yeah. Hello. Welcome. It is Thursday. Welcome to the Pagan Perspective. I am Megan, aka Sabira Sri. And more than likely, a lot of people are going to watch this on replay instead of live. So no problem. I'm anticipating that. It's just timing today with it being the 4th of July in the United States. It was just going to be faster for me to just be able to do a live video versus recording and editing and uploading. So um, just because we're running around and doing a lot of stuff because it is a fun day. Oh, we do have people watching. Say hello and let me know where you're watching from uh, if you're watching. So happy 4th of July to those in the United States. And today we are talking all about uh, pagan ethics and values. Uh, so I actually have um, the questions I, I did you know, have them all down this time. Uh, so I thought that would be a good place to start. I did wear my red, white, and blue little thingy on flower crown uh, today, but uh, we went to a berry festival, which was really, really fun, super Americana. And um, it was it was adorable, it was really adorable. So, so that was a lot of fun. And we're gonna stay in though, um, the dog doesn't like the fireworks, so. I, I like to stay in and keep her calm and uh, keep her happy. So, but let's get into it because that's why you're here, right? So we have some ethical questions uh, for this week's video. Now, if you have been watching um, the other hosts, I only saw very briefly a little bit of Kara's. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm gonna repeat anything. Um, but it's our personal perspective. So if we do repeat stuff, that just means that we share those ethics. So that's pretty cool. Um, so basically, the there's a lot of questions this time around. So if you have ethical questions, um, or if you want something elaborated, just go ahead and put it in the um, comment section, and I will try and get to it. So, all right, let's start. <laughs> um, so the first one basically was just, can you do an ethics, you know, a whole video on ethics. And so, yes, we can, and we're doing it. So the next one is, do you believe in good and evil or a form of universal morality? Okay. Yeah. So for me, I don't believe in absolute evil. Uh, and therefore I also don't believe in absolute good. I believe that everything is, it, it comes in balance. So uh, my core belief when it comes to the universe is all about balance. And so there is no, you can't completely go to one end because you're, you're a teeter totter. So you always have the ability to go, you can go pretty far, but you always have that other end of you that has that potential, right? So someone could be so far over onto a negative side uh, and, you know, just everything they're doing could be really, really negative. However, they always have the potential um, to be on the other side. So uh, there is no um, you're all or nothing kind of thing. So there's always a balance. And as far as universal morality, yes, I absolutely do. There are certain universal truths, um, universal law, universal um, just knowledge base. And that is something that, um, I very much follow. So, and then, you know, there's also kind of the wisdom that, so we say the wisdom that grandmother has given us. Um, and so, you know, without going too, too much into it, um, you know, we have, so the, the entire North America and South America, it's, we believe that it is a certain place. And within that, we have a certain amount of universal law that governs it based on deity. So um, sort of my best way to describe it. But yes, I absolutely believe in universal morality. Uh, and I believe that it's a continuum, that it is a gray space. It is not black and white, um, that there's always, you know, contingency, that there's always some sort of you know, it's not just thou shall not kill, right? It, it, there's there's so many contingencies. Well, what about self-defense? What about, you know, for survival? Those sort of things. So, you know, it definitely, I, I think it's important to recognize the gray areas 
And while morality is important, yes, I believe that in the universal morality where it really is uh, it, not only intent, but impact over intent is important. It's really about tipping that balance, trying to live farther on the positive spectrum than on the negative spectrum. And that's not to say that we will never be on the negative spectrum. In fact, I think that there are times where it's important. We're gonna have emotions over on that spectrum. We're gonna have things that happen. And the more that we can kind of be toward the center and a little bit more positive, I think is a much more balanced, balanced place to be. I'm on a live. Um, so that was the wife asking for her questions. Hi, Lady Blaine Wolf. Hello. Uh, so yes, so that would be my answer for that question. So the next one is, um, oh no, uh, the next one is many religions have a text or some authority figure that dictates what is right and wrong. How do you decide what is right and wrong? What guides your sense of morality? And so I think I said that a universal sense of morality. Uh, yes, we don't have a text. And I think in a way it actually, makes us have to look at morality more deeply and have a better understanding of morality and to have a, I would say an even greater understanding of morality than those with a text do because we don't just have a book that we can follow. We have to seek within ourselves right and wrong and learn from our conscience and learn from that around us um, what really, oh, hello, Christine, hello. So I, I think that in a way, not having a, a central text uh, actually in a way increases your morality. It increases, it increase your sense of morality and definitely for me, forces you to look a little bit deeper into what your morality really is and to figure out where your lines are, where your hard lines are, where your soft lines are. Because I think we all have those. We have hard morality lines, things that we won't cross. And then we have other ones that are like, oh, well, in this circumstance, maybe in this circumstance, I would do this, but in this one, I do this. You know, those are our soft lines. Whereas if you, you know, if you just go by a text, uh, depending on how it's translated or whatnot, you're you're going by a very rigid set of moral guidelines that you didn't really decide for yourself. So uh, there's all these lines that you're not supposed to cross. You're really not wondering why not, right? You're, I mean, I hope you're wondering why not. However, the 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 text is saying not to. The text is saying just follow me, and that's it, and that's all you're supposed to do. And so I I kind of feel without having that text. It opens you up to so much more. And, and I think that that's really exciting. Um, so did, Christine says, um, what if morality is an offshoot of the golden rule, except it's do unto yourself as others uh, do unto you, um, as you'd have others do unto you? Yeah, that's great. And, and if that's how you follow, I think for me, that kind of falls into the read. Um, and, and so the idea of any harm, none do as thou wilt, um, which is, another offshoot of the golden rule. Um, the only thing is then you get into hypotheticals and, and that works for you. And I think that's great. And honestly, I, for the most part, I definitely feel like the read has a place in my practice. Absolutely. Um, I also think about it though, because I know, especially being a therapist, I know so many people who are very self-destructive and I think about like a masochist, for example, well, if I'm, you know, do unto others as you would have done unto you. Well, a masochist who wants to be, you know, hurt or punished or humiliated or something like that, if they start doing unto others how they would want done unto them, maybe not. <laughs> so I, I, I just, I think that there's always going to be that um, hypothetical and there's always going to be outside the bell curve, right? And so I think that's why internal morality, having your own sense of morality and recognizing that it's a spectrum and that people are going to fall in different places. And, and it's, for me, it's about balance. So that's what I like to say. While I absolutely think the read is, is a very good guideline for me, I strive for balance. And I think that that's, that's the only thing I can really do for myself that that follows along with my path that makes the most sense. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, it's Wicca an offshoot of Aleister Crowley's spirituality. 
Uh, no, no, it is not. Um, but it's not necessarily, the, it's not that there's not any um, influence taken, but it's definitely not. Um, so uh, Wicca was started by Gerald Gardner. Um, so, which kind of a contemporary, I would say, a little bit off timing for Crowley. Um, Crowley is different though. Crowley has a lot more Golden Dawn kind of stuff going on with it where um, Wicca is much more um, neo-pagan earth centered um, around more of the old Dianic cults um, and the goddess cults. So, oh, Golden Dawn. Oh my gosh, that's a that's a whole nother video. Ask that. What, what is the Golden Dawn or talk about the Golden Dawn? Ask that on the Pagan Perspective Facebook page because that, that could be a whole video on Undo Itself. But I've got to get through a couple more questions. Uh, let's see. Um, the next one was, um, so I guess there is like, what are, um, you know, opinions about ethics between like teachers and students and ethics in hypothetical situations, which we were kind of talking about there. Um, is it ever okay to magically harm or bind or infringe another's right if that person's harming others or themselves? Okay, and then the last one, if you practice spell work, do you believe it's okay to cast a spell on someone else without their knowledge? All right, so that's a lot there. So for the first thing, between teachers and students, um, so there's a power differential. So as a therapist, I'm very aware of this power differential, right? And it's it's very inappropriate to ever have a relationship with a client um, because of that power differential. So a teacher and a student, to me, it would depend on A, are they a teacher and a student at the time of the relationship? And if so, no, because then there's a there is a power differential there. If it's a teacher student situation, though, in which it's like you're trading, so um, there's kind of a, a whole school of thought. So I do a lot of like Renaissance fairs and things like that, and so you can trade knowledge. So, for example, one person might be really good at um, weaving, for example, while another person might be good at breathing fire. And maybe the person who weaves wants to learn how to breathe fire and the pre pe person who breathes fire might wanna learn how to weave. And so then in that case, they both become teachers and both become students. And if they wanted to get into relationship, that's fine. Like. <laughs> That's no problem. And so there still is a teacher student relationship there. However, it's not, uh, there's not a power differential, right? Because they're teaching a skill and they're trading for that skill, right? So the power differential equals out and there's a balance to it. There always needs to be that balance. So in that case, for example, I'm fine with it. However, if we're talking about like a college professor and a student, there's a power differential there and it's out of balance. Uh, and so then, no, that would need to be something in the future kind of thing. So that would be my answer to that question. Um, and then the next part was, is it ever okay to magically harm or bind or infringe another's right if that person is harming others or themselves? This one gets tricky and this is where that balance comes into play. And for me, it's all about balance of what is going to do more harm, right? So if binding someone, um, which more often than not happens without their knowledge, if binding someone in the act of binding them will actually cause less harm to a greater number of people than it will cause less harm to that individual. So, you know, if we said, you know, if we just look at in terms of numbers, right? If harming that individual, you know, harms them to a level 10, right? The harm though that that person could be doing if they weren't bound is gonna be a level 100, right? So then, it makes sense and that's why. However, there is always a balance and magic will always take anything that it gives. And so keep that in mind, if you are the one to be casting that spell, you're gonna be taking some of that on. And so that has to be considered into the balance. So while the balance, right, so the number might be a, a 10 for harm against the person that you need to bind, might be a 100 for, uh, the, the harm that that person could do to other people. And maybe it is 80 
or something like that for harm that's going to, you're going to get back, right? Well, there's still 10 left, you know what I mean? And so um, that, therefore, it would mean that you go ahead and do it if you can accept those consequences. You just need to always be willing to accept the consequence of whatever magic you perform. And remember that whatever magic you're putting out there, it does come back to you. That's that threefold law. And it's not exactly threefold. However, it's it usually is dependent on the amount of energy putting forth and what you're asking for. So the bigger ask that you have, the more things you're asking for, the more it's going to come back on you. And so because there needs to... The universe has to balance itself out. So I did talk about um, universal magic. So if you want to check out that video on this channel um, on how sort of that balance works and how what we send out comes back um, and how we have to be prepared for that. However, if it's what needs to happen, you know, if it's something that's important and it could help people, then then maybe it's the right choice. Um so it's, um, hello, Stephanie. Um, what if you don't believe in threefold? I think threefold is like kinds of afterlives we all believe in. And, and that maybe that's for you. So this is just my perspective. Um, so, you know, for me, I have seen too much evidence of threefold where it's not exactly, that's why I say I don't believe exactly in threefold. I just believe in um, energy. So I just, I've witnessed it even in science where energy comes back, it, you know, goes out, it comes back. Um, so it, it's sort of like a, a ripple effect, right? So if you drop, so if you've got a, a cup of water and you drop something into it, the ripples are going to go out and then they'll hit the wall and then they come back right? So we drop our magic in and it goes out, it hits the intended target and it comes back in and it comes back to us. And whether or not you believe that it it's exactly threefold or not, um, however, it the idea is that what we send out energetically, we do get back. Um, um, Awesome. Cool. I'm glad I was able to make it make sense to you. <laughs> awesome, Stephanie. So yeah, so that is, um, so that's my view on sort of the spell part of that. And I think that was the last question too. If you practice spell work, do you believe it's okay to cast a spell on or about somebody without their knowledge? Normally, no. Normally I would say absolutely not, um, that it on average. However, there's always those hypothetical situations. And I think that, you know, we always run the danger of talking about hypotheticals. However, it's it's good to kind of give yourself that, that idea of where your hard and your soft lines are when it comes to ethics so that you, you know kind of where you would fall. And sometimes you won't have an answer and that's okay too. You don't always have to have an answer because you don't necessarily know until you're put in that position. Uh, it's just an interesting way to have that conversation and sort of think about your own ethics and your own morality and go, hmm, where would I draw that line? Would it be a hard line or would it be a soft line? Would it be dependent on other variables? And so for me, that's casting a spell on somebody without their knowledge or permission or consent, basically. Again, it would be sort of, you know, an impact over intent thing. It would be this I idea that if somebody was causing so much harm that I needed to do something and in order to stop that, in order to stop the harm that they were causing. And it was so exponentially greater than the harm of doing something without somebody's consent, which that would take a lot. And, and so I would have to really consider, and it would be totally case by case. Uh, and, and I would really have to weigh hard that decision. Uh, so it's not something I would ever take lightly. Uh, if, if I was even, to consider it, which which would take a lot. Um, um, and there's so much more now when I was younger. Yeah, absolutely. And time, I think age too. And there's so many things that you know we realize is is we have more experiences because I think age sometimes yes, age brings wisdom. Absolutely, it's also experiences because I know a lot of kids who have lived way more than a lot of adults I know. <laughs> they have just, they have been through some really intense things. And because of that, they have so much sage wisdom and so much life experience at such a young age. So I think that again, you know, there's no one cookie cutter way of kind of figuring out some sort of 
scale in which people would know things or wouldn't. It's just never going to be like that. There's always going to be that bell curve and there's going to be the outliers and there's going to be, you know, the extremes and, of either direction. And so that's why for me, it's all about the balance is finding some sort of balance where, you know, you're going to need to find for yourself your comfy spot with it, right? I think that's where ethics really can become something for the everyday where we can really kind of chew on it and sit with it in the moment, which is what is my everyday ethics, right? And and for me, that's balance. For me, that's trying to find a balance in my life, in my work, in you know my relationships. And when I'm in most in balance, I feel the best. And I I know I'm getting the best out, I'm sending the best out and I'm getting the best. And that doesn't mean I'm super positive all the time. That means I have a balance. That means I'm acknowledging my, you know, my heartache and my failures and my successes. And I'm giving them all validation and I'm giving them all their due. And I'm finding that nice balanced place within myself. And it's that equilibrium where it's, I wouldn't necessarily say it's perfectly calm waters because I'm always sending out ripples and getting back ripples. However, the ripples are a beautiful tide coming and going, natural speed, no tsunamis, <laughs> you know, no, no giant waves and no droughts. It's just a nice, calm ebb and flow. And that that's my ideal. And if I can live in that place, I know I'm living within my own morality and ethics um, because I'm not upsetting that rhythm within myself, if that makes sense. Um, so somebody, Christine said, how do you know if something is a result of a spell or a result of mental illness that is coming to the surface? Well, um, there are certain ways and every tradition has different ways of doing that. So in my path, which if you've seen me before, you know, it's not something that I can necessarily share. And, and the reality is it wouldn't work for you. So it, it's, it's my path and my family's path. And so the way that we tell um, that we have a specific spell that lets us know whether or not something is uh, a psychic warfare, um, you know, spell work, energy work, or it is a mundane. So I would say that, um, that for you, the most thing is to sit with yourself. I would meditate. I would maybe even consider talking to a therapist However, make sure up front that you are clear with the therapist that like I, I did a whole video on this channel on mental illness um, and finding the right kind of therapist as a therapist. So really watch that video because I talk all about like the right way to interview a therapist and how to find one because you don't want one that will stigmatize or pathologize your religion. And there are many good ones out there. It's just some of them will, they'll just say everything is a result of your religion. And that's just stupid. <laughs> so so don't don't go with one of those, those type of people. So interview them first. Um, but I here's the thing. The reality is as a as a therapist, I think everyone can benefit from therapy. I don't think it needs to be all the time. I think it you know, you can go for a couple of months and have what I call a booster, you know, and kind of get yourself built up. And then you go in for checkups whenever you need. I don't think it necessarily has to be an all your life thing. It can be. I just think therapy can help anybody. I think that if you have the right therapist who validates you and who understands how to work with somebody, it can be amazing. And it's really, really helpful for your mental health. I think of it as a wellness thing. I don't think of it necessarily as the mental illness. I like to think of mental wellness. And you know what? If you think something's going on, then something's going on. And that means something's out of balance. And so you can put it into balance yourself maybe, or you can maybe ask for some help. And it's totally up to you which you choose. I know that for me, even as a therapist, I've seen a therapist and it's wonderful. It's wonderful to be able to have that sounding board, even just to just to have somebody that you can go talk to that knows how to, to separate themselves and not make it about them, right? Which sometimes friends are wonderful. Let's be real though. Oftentimes friends will make it about them. They'll say, that's okay, but... I did this this one time or something and and that can be great and it's super helpful and they give you a hug and they make you feel better and and 
it's just not the same though as when you're getting real validation from a therapist who's trained in how to give that, you know, in, in the right sort of way. And so I know for me, I really enjoy that mental wellness part of it and just being able to kind of purge all the things that are going on in my head. And so, you know, I would just say, um, um, I'm on a shot for mental illness because how do I get off of it? Um, that would be something. So yeah, unfortunately I can't help you there. If you're on medication, um, that you'd have to talk to your, your psychiatrist or GP and your therapist. Um, it, I, I, I couldn't tell you how, cause there's so many things, there's so many shots, there's so many meds, there's so many different diagnoses, there's so many different things. I, and I don't know your personal case, so I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I can't answer that one. What I can say though, you know, when it comes, when we come back to kind of the topic, right, of this whole week is this morality and ethical conversation. And I know that when I think about ethics in therapy, you know, you should have a therapist and a doctor who, if your goal is to get off a of medication, they should be working toward that. Uh, that should be their number one priority if it's your number one priority, right? So you are number one and what you want should be number one. So that that's what I can say. And so go to them and be like, this is what I want. And that's what they should be working toward for sure. Absolutely. Ah, wow, guys, I've been on here for 26 minutes. Can you believe that? It always seems to fly by. So, um, oh, ALL said happy fourth. Yay, happy fourth. Just sort of going back, making sure I didn't miss anything. Super, um, um, yes, absolutely. Sometimes you can't get off meds. Stephanie, you are absolutely right. And, and you know, and you can work toward lessening them sometimes. You can work toward different meds, especially most times when people want to get off a med, it's because of the side effects. And there's always new meds being, um, put on the market. And so, and they're getting better and better and they're getting more specialized. The older meds were what we call um, kind of these, they basically hit everything. They just sort of were like a spray effect. And so they didn't really know what they were doing so much. And now they're doing so much better with psychotropics and targeting things and making longer half-lives for medications. Um, so really, if you're looking at a medication, um, half-life is important. Go ahead and ask your doctor, what is the half-life? on that medication. If it's a really short half-life, like for example, Paxil is an antidepressant with a very short half-life. And so one of the problems with it is that people then get serotonin withdrawal and a lot of people are ending up in the ER because of that. Now, nowadays they know that and so they can give other meds to sort of balance that out or you know, the person has to be really religious about taking it exactly on time all the time. Um, it's not to say it's a bad drug, it's just that because it has such a short half-life, which is basically how long that drug stays in your system, um, it just wears off so fast and that can be problematic for a lot of people. So ask about that. Um, a longer half-life is ultimately usually a better thing because it means it stays in your system longer. Uh, it can also have negative things too. If you have a problem with it, it's gonna stay in your system longer too. So just keep that in mind. It has to be something you discuss with your doctor though to figure out what is gonna be the best for you if coming off meds is the right thing. If it's not the right thing, what can you do to mitigate the symptoms if you don't like them? You know, cause there's other, you know, meds too that can help counteract some of the symptoms. So there's so many things that you can do to just make your quality of life better. Um, and, you know, and sometimes not completely either. So it really, it's going to be weighing, you know, what is, what's best overall, right? There's never, I wouldn't say never, but it's very rare that you're going to get something that is 100% perfect all the time. Just like I don't believe in absolute evil, I don't believe in absolute good either. And I just, there's always going to be a spectrum. There's a give and take with everything. And so, um, however, you can move toward a better quality, definitely. Um, so, um, Stephanie, yeah, exactly. Your brain doesn't make everything it needs. Exactly. Yep. Um, and the new ones are expensive. I know. Oh my gosh. It's ugh, the medic. Uh, I know we're doing 4th of July in the United States right now, but let me tell you, we need some help in the healthcare department. <laughs> um, oh, Stephanie, I sound like your doctor. I hope that's a good thing. <laughs> um, oh, I'm so sorry, Christine. I'm so, yeah, Stephanie, I would definitely, I would definitely think about that. Um, 
So, yeah, yeah. So it's definitely something to think about. Um, you know, there are people with their brain just doesn't make the right chemicals. I mean, chemical depression is is a thing, and um, and some people will just need to be on medication, just like diabetes. It's 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 exactly the same. You know, you need to be on insulin for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean you can't live a full, happy, and productive life. <laughs> you know, we pl plenty of people are on medications for the rest of their lives, and and they have beautiful, beautiful lives. Uh, and so there's no, um, there's nothing wrong with that either. It's more about if it's not something that's working for you, then I always suggest talking to your doctor and trying to find a way to make it work better for you. Uh, that's all. So, um, um, so I'm trying to see. So. I think, I think you guys are having a conversation between the two of you, so I'm lost, <laughs> but that's okay because I've been on here for half an hour. I can't believe it. Um, so, um, yeah, so you have a whole alphabet and numbers use them, yes. So I think that is going to be it for today. I can't believe we had so many people on watching today. That's awesome. Uh, so I'm really, you know, happy that we were able to have the conversation, and I hope um, people have a really wonderful day. Uh, whether you're celebrating the 4th of July, whether you don't celebrate the 4th of July, um, you know, whether whatever temperature it is outside right now, I'm in Oregon and it's gorgeous. It's like 81 degrees, which if you've been watching me on this channel, you know, just coming from Maui, oh, for me, this has been the perfect weather. We got to go out to a little berry festival today. So that was beautiful and uh, getting some work in the garden. So I'm super excited about that. Christine, I have not, well, have I been to Washington State? I think I've like driven into it slightly, but I haven't been up there yet. So, but I am going to um, the Washington Renaissance Fair. Um, what, in um, August, I think the last weekend or something like that. So um, if you end up seeing me uh, at the, the Renaissance Fair, say hello. Uh, I know that there has been, we've had people on, I've had people on here who've watched me, who've found me in different places. So if you found find me, I've got bright red hair. So <laughs> I'm pretty hard to miss. Um, but yes, yeah, so, um, oh, oh, okay, you like me live. Well, thanks, I like lives too, I think they're fun. You actually got me on my bed today because it had the best lighting. <laughs> so, all right, but I will see you all, yes, next week. I think we have a regular week next week. Yeah, it was just the subs week. So I will see you all next week. And, oh, next week's my birthday, actually. So I will see you then. All right. I will see you all later. As always, blessed be and aloha. Bye, everyone.